Earlier this week, we got a player's perspective on the Bills defensive outlook for 2024. This time, we're going to hear from the coaching and analytic perspective today on Locked on Bills. You are Locked on Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. I'm joined now by Cody Alexander, who is one of my favorite football people to learn from. Those are the people I like to talk to, people that I learn from. And I always do that when I get a chance to speak with Cody or read his work. In fact, Cody was on last year when the Bills were getting ready to face the Miami Dolphins. He gave us a ton of insight on perhaps what the Bills should do in that game and wound up working out quite well for Buffalo. And uh, look, Cody's work on defensive scheme is unmatched, and I'm really excited to get his perspective on the Bills defense in 2024. In fact, he recently dropped his preview article of the Bills defense that is included in today's show notes that you can check out. Cody, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. And you've really kind of done some interesting things recently in the space, introducing Havoc ratings. And that's a big part of the way that you're going about these previews for each team's defense. And so as we're about to get into some of your thoughts in the Bills defense, why don't you fill us in on what Havoc ratings are? Yeah, I really wanted to come up with a better way of evaluating player production. I think we can all, you know, the eye test is so objective and we don't really necessarily have a really good way of like actually rating players against it. So what we're doing at Field Vision, uh, which is a predictive analytics company, we're using play-by-play data to really look at what are actual plays worth? What are the things that are happening in those plays actually worth in terms of like some sort of a point value and then being able to cut things play by play so that we can actually look at the true production of players. It's also scheme biased. So if, for instance, if you're not running a lot of cover one, uh, then you're not going to be real high up on the list of cover one. And so what ends up happening, though, is by formulating that and putting this all together, we can then actually look apples to apples across the NFL of like how teams are built and not only that, but how players are producing. So it gives us just a more intuitive way than just a generic, uh, you know, oh, this guy's a 90, you know, man rating or uh, kind of like what PFF does with their with their rating system. This is more intuitive. It's actually off of like machine learning and AI and built off of uh, what they're actually doing on the field. How satisfied are you with the conclusions that it's coming to and how things have played out? Yeah, I think it, the way uh, that we we did this, um, I've been working with a guy, Jackson, who he's the one that kind of built this built this system. I'm not a data guy. I'm more of a, the bus driver. I'm making sure that the numbers are actually uh, correlating to what's happening on film. And I'm really excited about this because I think it's completely different. The deal with like like NFL Pro just came out. Uh, they can't do like the NFL is not going to do like anything predictive and they're not going to do player ratings or anything like that. So really the only thing that we have out there are these PFF grades. And so I wanted to create something that was a little bit more intuitive. That's actually built off of the play by play data and what we're actually getting from these players in production. And I'm, I'm really ecstatic about how it, how it turned out. All right. So if anybody wants to learn more about this again, in today's show notes, you'll be able to find a link to Cody's work where, You can see a whole lot of information on this and, of course, the Bills' defensive preview, which we're going to get into right now. And one of the things that you wrote in the article was you described the edge pairing of Greg Rousseau and A.J. Epinesa as the new normal in Buffalo. And so I'm curious. Let's start there. I'm I'm a big – I love defensive ends. I love defensive line play, so I always got to start there. 
What's your outlook for those players in 2024? Yeah, I think that this is a good pairing. And I think it's a pairing that now that they're getting full time usage, they're not having to look over their shoulder and think, okay, you know, I'm getting subbed out right here. These are the guys that are going to be playing on a normal down basis. So I think their production is going to get up. You know, Rousseau is really good uh, in the pass rush along with uh, Epinesa. Now, the thing that Epinesa needs to work on is run stopping ability. That's kind of been where he's he really needs to progress in that. But in terms of like a, a, a total package at edge, that's where really Rousseau so gets you and I'm, I'm excited to see his growth going forward with the bills yeah a couple of, of players that are young draft picks and feels like their best football might still be ahead of them even though AJ Epinesa just signed a second contract Greg Rousseau entering his fourth season I think there's a lot of ceiling for those guys to develop into now the player in this edge mix that's really fascinating is Von Miller and Boy, it's tough to kind of figure out what to expect from him. Of course, when the Bills signed him for those the first 11 games before he got hurt with a torn ACL, I mean, he was everything they could have dreamed of. And then, of course, since then, it's been a, a tough road back from the ACL, obviously nowhere near what you would expect from Von Miller last year. And so you're hopeful that two years removed from the injury that you get a better version of Von, but he's also 35. So how are you calibrating expectations for Von Miller in 2024? I think he's going to be more of a package guy. He's going to come on third down. He's going to have one thing that he's going to do, and that's going to be rushing the quarterback. I think if you use him as an every down player, you're just increasing that you know risk of uh, re-injuring or just the production is not going to be there with what you want. But I think if you keep him with, hey, kind of almost like, like a pitch count, if you keep a pitch count with him, you package things where, hey, we're going to match you up in certain situations where we think we're going to get advantageous. Maybe we can manipulate a way to get you on a running back or we like this matchup with you, maybe even moving one. It, be, it really what it does is it unlocks you to move one of like FNS over so inside on a guard and letting kind of Vaughn Miller sit on that outside edge and just go go get the quarterback. I think that to me is where you can gain a lot of production from him. Yeah, I think that's a, a good layer to the Bills defensive end situation in general because between Rousseau, Epinesa, and Dewan Smoot, who I think will be the four, any one of those guys you could reduce inside and then bring in Von Miller. And I think you put everybody in a good position to maximize their skill sets and get your best four rushers on the field. So I, I am, I do think that's certainly got to be part of the plan with Von Miller is being selective with him to get the most out of what's left in the tank. Now, one player I'm I'm guessing did quite well with, with the Havoc ratings is, is that Oliver had that big breakout season uh, for the Bills last year after, you know, of course, a top 10 pick and waiting for the big splashy plays to really come. They came last year. So I'm curious, like, what do the ratings say? And is there more to unlock with him? And then just kind of some general thoughts on that pairing with him and Daquan Jones. Yeah, so he actually was a top 10 interior defensive lineman for us last year in Havoc, in Havoc rating. He was a 17 against the run, and then he was a top 10 pass rusher. And I think that's really what's going to be the key in this defense is, is can you get those young guys one-on-ones by requiring double teams on Oliver. And so what that's going to open up is for a guy like Daquan Jones, who is also kind of an above average pass rusher. So this defense is set up like you typically see in these less aggressive. And by that, I mean, uh, blitz rates are going to be relatively low with the bills. Uh, the jets are built in a similar fashion. The, the 49ers are built in a similar fashion of where we really want that defensive line. Cleveland's another great example of like, we really want that defensive line getting after the quarterback being pass rush and kind of holding gap integrity on top of that and letting our athletic linebackers really kind of run and hit. And this is, this is with Ed Oliver. And, and if he can continue the production that he has, I mean, we're talking about a top 10 interior defensive lineman, which just unlocks a lot of things for, especially when you have uh, edges that are kind of just coming into their own. Yeah, I think one of the underrated components of like defensive line play that I don't think gets enough credit is the collaboration of four guys working together. And it was interesting. I was I was listening to, I think it was Chris Long and Chris Long was asked a question. He said, would you rather play with another dynamic edge rusher or a really good inside pass rusher? He said, give me the inside pass rusher all day long. The other edge is great, but that person next to you that can create issues as well, that's going to free up one-on-ones. And, and that's what that's what this is all about. Can you get one-on-one -on -one battles and can you win? And I feel like, to your point there, Ed Oliver is kind of that piece that maybe draws a little bit of extra attention to make sure that 
the rest of the rush gets the one on one matchup. So they'll, they'll be in position to win. Yeah. And really what ends up happening is like, especially if you set um, Oliver at a three technique, you're going to get the slide that way. So the center's yeah. going to go that way just to ensure that they're going to do that to, you know, make sure that they have an extra hat over there, which is going to open up a one-on-one -on -one for your nose. So there's a guy like Daquan Jones, who's already an above average pass rusher. Now he's gaining a one-on-one. -on -one. And then it also just kind of gives you now another one-on-one -on -one away from that to the nose side. So you're really stealing a lot. Uh, it's a simple math game, right? Because we have four, they have five. If we can pull one of those away to create some sort of a double team, now we've kind of uh, amplified our rush and we've got one-on-ones in different areas. So yes, and I, and if you look at what happened in this offseason, a lot of these guys inside got paid. And so I think we're seeing the NFL kind of market adjustment of saying, hey, we probably need to start paying these inside guys that are really dynamic and that are good against the run and the pass, not just guys that are kind of you know pluggers and hold, hold Holding on to those double teams. Yeah, the defensive tackle market experienced a, a major boost. And and what's funny is that Oliver got paid, but he was on the low end of a lot of those new deals. And I think the Bills got one heck of a deal, assuming Oliver continues at the rate that we saw in 2023. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. When your schedule is packed with kids' activities, big work projects, and more, it's easy to let your priorities slip. Even when we know what makes us happy, it's hard to make time for it. But when you feel like you have no time for yourself, non-negotiables like therapy are more important than ever. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire. That'll get you matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. Now, the talk of this defense right now is linebackers uh, for good and bad reasons. The good reason is Terrell Bernard and, and what he showed last year. Again, I'm curious to kind of see where he fell in with the havoc. I, I'm guessing pretty good. But Matt Milano uh, going to miss probably you know, almost all of the season if he's able to come back late. We'll find out. But Matt Milano, obviously one of the better linebackers in the NFL. And, of course, the Bills didn't have him for most of last season. So, unfortunately, they're kind of getting used to playing defense without Matt Milano. So I guess two parts of the question first is Terrell Bernard. And then secondly, the replacement option appears to be Dorian Williams. What can you give us on Dorian Williams uh, in terms of your insight on him being a sufficient replacement? Yeah, so Terrell Bernard was right outside of the top 10 last year. He's one of the better coverage linebackers, uh, and he's really good even at man coverage, even though the Bills don't necessarily run a ton of man. So this is somebody that comes from a relatively complex defense in what the what he was doing at Baylor. Um, he's used to kind of being that off-ball backer in front of a line and kind of that run and hit mode of, I've got a primary gap, where's my secondary gap? So with me, I really like Terrell Bernard. Uh, he's a really intuitive player. Player. He's a coverage linebacker. He's built in a very athletic mode and he can really run. Now with Dorian Williams, the one thing that really stands out with him is again, he's kind of built in the same mode as Terrell Bernard. He's really good at man coverage, didn't have a lot of snaps. So his rating's obviously not high for us, but he gives you that ability in the few snaps that he had of, hey, this guy can really add to value in the coverage department and really allow you to do that. You know, the other thing with Terrell Bernard is that he was, he's really, Really good pass rusher. So in, in, in a blitzer. So that gives you now, and what we're seeing too in the NFL is you're building tandems that one guy is more of your off ball guy. That's really just going to stay off the ball. He's going to be stay at that second level, whether it be coverage or just fit, you know, just fitting off his gap. And then you have another guy where you really want them to be the pass rush specialist in, in their blitzer. And so that's where you have Bernard and Williams. And I will just say this: one person that to keep an eye on is Nicholas Moreau. He was above average linebacker last year. He's somebody that doesn't necessarily add a lot of value in the coverage game, but he can add value in the run game. So maybe there you, we see a little bit more of a 4-3. Um, I know that this has been a pure almost – kind of like what the Cowboys were, where they were just pure, we're only running nickel, we don't have a three linebacker set. But that's something to look forward to as more teams start using more 12 personnel. Well, an interesting piece of that conversation about three linebackers has been, well, Taron Johnson's here. And Taron Johnson, obviously, second team all pro in 2023, one of the best slot defenders in the entire NFL. I'm curious from you, what 
what makes him so important for this Bills defense? Yeah, well, if you're going to be a nickel-based defense, the, the two fulcrums of this are going to be your nickel position, and then they're going to be that boundary safety or that free safety is what a lot of these NFL guys call it. So having a nickel that can play in the box and can play in coverage, especially one that is a little bit more of a corner, that is really what you want. That's kind of like, that's the, the crown jewel of slots. It's one thing to be able to have three three safeties and put a safety down there that can kind of play that in a 12 personnel, but they're really, they're really guarding more of a tight end. Well, what do you do when, you know, we get these teams that are now 12 personnel, but they have a tight end, a flex tight end, and it's really 11 personnel. And you, you start playing with these teams and these concepts and they have to be able to cover. And Taron Johnson, really, if you just look at it, just in terms of just how he performs, I mean, he's a top 10 corner in the NFL, even though he's a primary slot guy, he's a really, really good and one of the best slots in the NFL. So one of the interesting dynamics about how the NFL is evolving is I think you're seeing more offenses use bigger people, right? More 12 personnel, 13. I mean, the Chiefs the Chiefs came out in 13 personnel during the playoffs, right? And that right. created some problems for a lot of teams. You're seeing more two-back stuff. A lot of this is influenced by the, the Shanahan tree. For a Bills defense that is typically static with back seven personnel, how do you kind of thread this needle knowing that you don't want to take Teron Johnson off the field, right? That's not part of your plan. That's not going to get your best players on the field. Do the Bills need to get creative with how they combat some of these bigger personnel offenses? You know, one of the things that they could easily transition into and that is becoming more popular with four down teams is getting to these five man front reductions, meaning that they're going to shift one guy inside. They're going to walk a guy down. So this is a situation where you could see maybe a guy like uh, Bernard, even though he's kind of a smaller body, but like walking down on the edge, you could even use a guy like Murrow or Dorian Williams where, hey, we're just going to shift you down into a glorified nine technique. And then you really just got to hold the edge. And what that does is it gives you a five-man front so you're kind of gapping out that front and you're you're combating kind of that nature of the 12 personnel look but you're not having to work you know you're not having to take Taron Johnson out because that's kind of the key is you don't want to move them outside like we're seeing with the Chiefs do with McDuffie they're kicking him outside McCrary's another good slot that yeah. you see the Titans kick him outside uh, when they go into these base personnels you know, Buffalo really doesn't want to run with a three linebacker core. They don't want to run from a four, three. So how do you get into that? You can get into what they're called penny looks. So it's a five man front with a solo backer in the back. You know, the thing with Johnson is he is so good near the line of scrimmage. Uh, you know, he's almost like and the really his only comparison is like a Brian Branch, who really is a safety. I mean, we're seeing this with the Lions. They're kicking him back in base. So for a corner playing run support, he's one of the top people that are doing it. He's not afraid to mix it up. And really, with a five-man front, you can do a lot of different things to cover him up. And that's probably what they're doing is even if you get into a personnel, he's going to be mainly towards the strength and setting the front to him. That way, he's kind of gapped out, and you're not asking him to ever be in an A-gap. That's fun. That's a, that's an interesting idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be paying attention to that throughout the course of the season and see if the Bills lean into some of those penny fronts. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't even visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours, and over 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. So hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash LockedOnNFL. That's linkedin.com slash LockedOnNFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Now, one of the staples of the Bills' defense that's been really good under Sean McDermott has been the safety tandem of Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. And those guys are no longer in the mix. Taylor Rapp, now kind of the guy at safety. And then between DeMar Hamlin, Cole Bishop, Mike Edwards, that's kind of your group to replace them. So my question here is, how difficult of a transition do you expect this to be? Like, 
Do you think there's going to be growing pains? I know that Hyde and Poyer were not themselves the last two years, but their presence, I think, meant something to this defense, at least from you know a communication standpoint, making sure you know, guys are lined up. Their, their knowledge of the scheme, their knowledge of what McDermott wants to do is so good. I think that helps elevate everybody else. How big is this transition? I think it's going to be – this is the one thing that kind of worries you about the Bills is this safety play. Um, I think corner and at the slot, I think you're pretty much set. I, I think everybody feels really, really good about what they are. But that communication piece that comes from the safety, you've got three guys that are pretty much all stacked together ratings-wise. They're, they're kind of like, you know, out of 64 starting safeties, all of them are right there at that bottom, like right there at 58 through 60. Um, you know, nothing necessarily stands out in a coverage aspect. You know, I do think Rap has had experience starting. He's probably the most seasoned one. Hamlin has really kind of been uh, more of a special teamer. Uh, Cole Bishop getting hurt as a rookie and then missing all of camp and doing those things. You know, you can sit in a room, you can kind of go through walkthroughs, but in terms of actual playing and getting on that, you know, they really they drafted him to be a starter probably next to rap and now he's hurt. He's not been able to play. So I think that that's going to be a little bit of a lag. This is a group though, that can kind of grow over the season. Uh, and maybe we look up at the end of the year and Cole Bishop is starting rap is basically a serviceable, you know, serviceable starter. These are things that I think next year, that are going to have to be adjusted, but right now these are going to give you kind of a, a right around the average of what an NFL starting safety is going to look like. Now you mentioned a lot of comfort in the Bills' corner situation, of course, which includes Taron Johnson, but the outside duo of Rasul Douglas and Christian Benford. Kind of curious to get your your takes on these guys, especially kind of a young guy in Christian Benford, who I think has got a chance to be really good in this league. Yeah, the thing is, is they they really got some of the best zone corners uh, in the NFL. And I think with Roswell Douglas, you're talking about one of the, if not the best. I, Charverius Ward is a little bit ahead yeah. of him, but he, they, we're talking like 1A and 1B in terms of zone corners. The Bills don't really want to run man at a high volume. Um, that's one way to help the safety situation. And that might be something that they can they can kind of do, especially if we can get, you know, Elam uh, to kind of step up and play a little bit more like he did. He is a first round draft pick, play a little bit more like he did in the SEC, especially as an on ball corner. But when you really look at this group, this is a group that um, are pretty much all going to be in the top 25 in terms of coverage. And they are definitely going to be some of the best in terms of zone coverage. So what, again, and this is part of that havoc rating that we have at Field Vision is it really formulates how well they are. They don't have to be good in man because they don't run a lot. But, man, when they run zone, which is what the builds do, they're some of the best in the NFL. Now, when I think of the best defenses in the NFL and what, what's important, I think it's that ability to create negative plays. Can you get negative plays? Can you get turnovers? Um, these offenses are really good, and I think you got to find ways to get them off – schedule, get them behind the sticks. And I think negative plays and turnovers obviously accomplish that. How do you feel this Bills team is set up as a defense to create those negative plays? Yeah, so they run, they're the third most middle field open team in the NFL. I think right behind the Cardinals and the Chiefs. So in order to do that, you've got to really have that front four that's really taking up some space up front. They're they're requiring those guys to really, hey, at some somewhere we're going to have to get a double team. And somewhere you're going to have to win uh, your matchup. And those linebackers have to be athletic and they have to be able to run and they have to be able to kind of get off blocks as well. So I do think uh, what they really try and do, I call it passive pressure. So they are a top 10 team in simulated pressures, meaning that they're going to, it's, they're going to have, uh, it's going to look like five or more, but they're really only going to rush four. And they're also fourth in middle of the field disguise, meaning that what you see pre-snap is not always what is going to be post-snap. So they're really trying to make these quarterbacks work post snap and they're really trying to make these offensive lines and the running backs in terms of protection work post snap so what you look is going to be a static uh four two five to and they mostly do everything from a two high shell so what you get is a, a static four two five with a two high shell but post snap it can be something completely different and they're doing that at a, probably about a third of the time 
And so, you know, you don't do this every down. Really the only teams that are doing this at a really super high volume are, are Raheem Morris and Evero. So the Panthers and the Falcons this year. So the, the NFC South will, will, will be like that. But what we're seeing in the NFL is this trend of middle of the field disguise, simulated pressures, let the four four man front eat a little bit and then let our athletic linebackers go to that. So how are they creating pressure? That's how they're creating pressure. And then obviously you want that timely blitz. Uh, maybe it's on a you know second and medium or a third and short where you're really plugging a backer in there and you're letting them just shoot a gap or you're using some sort of stunt in the front uh, to really kind of create a little bit of havoc up front. All right, it all kind of boils down to this. You're looking at this defense, the outlook for 2024. What are you most excited about? What are you most concerned about? I'm most excited about the corner room. I really do. I think that they have one of the better pairings. I, you know, I just put pause on the best pairing in the NFCs just because the I, I'm a big fan of DJ Reed and obviously Sauce Gardner Zap, but this is a, this is one of the better cornerback duos in the NFL you add Taron Johnson into that and it just completely changes the picture this is a you know when you're looking at it in a group of three this is one of the best in the NFL and they're going to give teams a lot of problems my concern off of that obviously in the back end is going to be that safety play and can you actually get production out of uh, you know any of those three and it builds on top of the overall way that this defense, this defensive roster has been built is that there's just not a lot of depth. And in that depth are a lot of question marks, whether it's can Von Miller uh, produce on third down when all he has to do is do that. Uh, what about, you know, what happens if we have another injury at safety and now we're relying on somebody that was really a reserve or a practice team or a special teamer now has to be kind of thrust into a starting role. So those are, the one thing those are kind of the couple things that I'm concerned about but in terms of a defense this really looks like a defense that if it can produce and if everybody can stay healthy that this is a team that can push for maybe a top 10 defense in the NFL well that's kind of where they've been under coach McDermott and we'll see if that continues once again in 2024 Cody thank you so much for giving us some of your time before we let you get out of here plug the work I know that I said that there's a link in today's show notes but you got a lot going on You've written books on defensive scheme. What? Where can people find all this stuff? Yeah, the best place to find everything that I do is matchquarters.com. Um, if you're interested in these havoc rates, we also have threat rates for offense. I would go to fieldvisionsports.com and go ahead and sign up. We're going to have an app that's going to drop, that's going to have all of this information in it, and it's going to drop uh, on week one. So we're really excited about that. So matchquarters.com is probably the best place to find everything that I have. I have links to everything. And I'll make sure that matchquarters.com is in today's show notes. Cody. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, a big thank you to Cody for coming on today's episode and sharing his insight on the Bills defense entering 2024. Always enjoy chatting with Cody, and I hope that you enjoyed listening to the conversation. All right, next up, the Bills play the Panthers Saturday to close out the preseason. As a reminder, join the Locked On Bills subtext community. That way you will get my in-game text. After every drive, I send out a synopsis of my thoughts and uh, things that I'm seeing in real time. So be part of that. And then, of course, that'll get you access to all of that throughout the course of the season. You get one-on-one -on -one text messaging with me. I also send out my first reaction to all major Bills news through the subtext. You also get access to our Discord channel where we've got hundreds, I think over 800 Bills fans in there talking Bills, Sabres, what we're grilling this weekend all kinds of cool stuff. So make sure you join the Locked On Bills subtext community and uh, let's continue the conversation there. There's a link in today's show notes for you to join. All right, folks, that's it for today. Our next conversation comes after Bills Panthers. So make sure you don't miss it. Make sure that you are subscribed. Would love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills. And I look forward to catching up with you again real soon.